Beauty is the attractive power of the truth, or the splendor of the truth. And so you could ask, what would the sun be without warmth and light? What would food be without deliciousness? So we can say, what's the truth without beauty? What's the truth without the compelling power, the delightful power to accept it and to live it and to love it? In the Catholic theological tradition, beauty is the clarity and the radiance of the inner reality of something. Beauty actually inspires love. Benedictine College is a place where people live the faith joyfully. The Catholic faith is on display in every corner. So if we're going to talk about the faith, we're going to talk about worship, we're going to talk about Christ, we're going to talk about education, if we can present it in a way that moves everybody's will toward that good, then we're actually inspiring love in them. We can transform the culture by bringing the sweetness and the delight of God's love through the material things of the world. That's the mission of Benedictine College. Hello and welcome this afternoon live from the Sheen Center to this special discussion, a lesson learned, lessons learned, witnesses to education during the pandemic. I want to give a, a big thank you to Benedictine College for helping to make this event possible. I'm joined today by Father Edwin Leahy and a number of other guests who work in education or are uh, students. I'm going to read some quick bios of those guests, and you can read their full bios on the New York Encounter website. Damien Basich is an educator, writer, and a translator. He's been involved in public higher education since 1997 and is professor of Ibero-American literatures at San Jose State University. Damien has been chair of the Department of World Languages and Literatures at San Jose State since 2012. Peter Fields graduated from the City College of New York. He is currently pursuing a PhD in physics at the University of Chicago. Father Edwin Leahy became headmaster of St. Benedict's Prep in 1972, where he is also an alumnus. He graduated from St. Ben's in 1963, took his first vows as a monk of the Benedictine Abbey of Newark in 1966, and was ordained to the priesthood in 1972. Today, St. Benedict's Prep has more than 750 students, most African, of African heritage and Hispanic backgrounds, which uh, are served by 58 faculty members. The school boasts nearly 6,000 alumni who have gone on to become not only leaders in their respective careers, but in their families and in their communities. Michelle Ratti is a high school science and literature, uh, language teacher at Brookwood School in Kensington, Maryland. She also often teaches natural history to elementary school students, and she's a mother of three boys. And my name is Patrick Tomasi. I am the Dean of Boys and a math and science teacher at Trinity Academy in Portland, Oregon. All right. Well, this hour, we are discussing education and what we learned during the pandemic. It's striking to think that Education has become so central to our national conversation, uh, more so than at any point in my memory other than maybe the implementation of Common Core. When schools began to close in March, when kids were home with their parents, when teachers were working remotely, colleges sent students home, something that we often overlook grew in importance in our eyes. In this conversation, I do not want to focus on the political back and forth that this generated, but obviously it would be unreasonable to pretend as if those, uh, the politi a political divide did not come up. Much of the debate at a national level has had to do with this question. Should we reopen schools or should we keep kids home until some future milestone, vaccination, herd immunity, eradication has been reached? This is an important question and one that for me as a teacher who's been working on Zoom for 11 months uh, has serious relevance for my daily life, as it does for many of you. But the pandemic has brought to the forefront lingering questions, ones that were already relevant, but that we did not see clearly, which are deeper. What is the role of the parent in the ch their child's education? Should more people consider homeschooling? How did some why did some students struggle so much with distance learning while others thrived? What was missing? How do we re uh, remedy the social inequities that, uh, in education that the pandemic exacerbated? 
but we're present already. What is the real purpose of education? Why bring kids back to school? These are the questions that we'd like to explore. So firstly, panelists, uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you, uh, what you experienced during the pandemic in terms of education. And Peter Fields, let's start with you. Hello, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my experience. Um, yeah, so I'm, as Patrick said, I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm in my second year, so if you do the math, uh, I was five months into my the beginning of my PhD uh, when the pandemic occurred and everything abruptly changed, the teaching assistant duties went online, um, graduate courses went online. Uh, I was doing some experiments at the time. My lab was closed. I later had to improvise some experiments in my apartment uh, um, to continue my work. Um, if I had to sum it all up in, in one sentence, uh, I would say the nature it wasn't, it's not that uh, the pandemic was hard. It's that graduate school is already a hard thing and then pandemic just made it a lot harder. Um, it tends, graduate school tends to be a, an onerous activity you know, without a pandemic filled with doubts about what you do and why you do it and all the reasons for why you're giving so much time to it. Um, and uh, being in person is, uh, you, it's, uh, that experience is filled with organic human encounters that uh, make that sacrifice worthwhile. Um, and, uh, uh, and not having that was uh, difficult. Um, at the same time, uh, the the pandemic also accented these questions, you know, why educate? What's, what's the point of learning, as, as you said? And, and uh, surprisingly, I, I did experience a grace of, of renewed interest in, in what I study because the things I do study are quite fascinating. So to summarize, you know, in my sort of, in the briefest way possible, uh, my experience of education during the pandemic was one of tested but ultimately resilient interest in, in what I study. Uh, and expectancy for uh, going back to normal. Great. Thank you, Peter. Michelle, what was education during the pandemic like for you? Um, so I'm afraid to be very negative, but really, I guess the word that came to mind the most was atrophy, just a wasting away. I felt like I was witnessing on Zoom a social intellectual atrophy and atrophy of motivation, um, even of their relationship with me and with each other. That was the predominant thing. When I was an undergraduate and um, read some of the ancient Greeks, I had this quote that I liked. It's kind of an odd quote from Democritus. Uh, it's very short. It says, to live badly is not to live badly, but rather to spend a long time dying. And my friends thought this was depressing. And for some reason, I thought this quote kind of inspired me because it meant Life is so precious. There isn't the time to live badly. There isn't the possibility to live badly. There's an urgency to live well. And this quote came back to me very vividly during quarantine because we're quarantining in order to avoid death. And yet it kept occurring to me that there was another kind of death I was witnessing, that I was witnessing the death of joyfulness, the death of curiosity, the death of personal responsibility as kids grew more and more lazy and we're always blaming the system. Um, that, that may be melodramatic to call that a death and to say such a thing. And I have tendencies towards melodrama, so maybe that's a fair accusation. <laughs> but on the other hand, we were allowing our kids to live badly in a way that gave me a tremendous sense of urgency and a great sadness to watch. And I do think there is at an age where they're being formed and they're being shaped to just put their lives on hold and to say, oh, this is all reversible. I don't know. That's a big assumption. I had this great 
urgency to want to lift them out of that. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Damien. Yeah. I'm trying to think, you know, there was so much going on at the time. I'm, you know, I'm in charge of a, apart from the fact that I'm a parent, right? So I have two kids, two elementary school age kids and dealing with all those things that all parents were dealing with. Um, you know, we have 35 faculty members in our department. And so uh, people were starting to ask me, what are we going to do? Right. And then uh, meetings after meetings with our dean and uh, deciding, well, what are we going to do? So it became a question. Two things um, started to happen. One is to help, you know, start to help each other think clearly. Right. Because there was a lot of information coming at us the news and the, the president of the, the university and the dean and the, the provost, et cetera. But, but trying to help people say, okay, let, let's just stop for a second. And let's look at what's happening and let's try and think this through, right? So let's help each other out and get through this. And secondly, um, you know, we, we educate in my department about 1200 students in a given semester. So, to communicate with them and to let them know well, this is this is what we're planning on doing this is where we're planning on heading and don't worry and you take it easy and take care of yourself and we're going to be with you so there was this this process of trying to think clearly trying to help um, all the faculty members and the staff um, help each other out to get through the initial period and then since then, among other things, it's been a matter of, you know, as a department chair, I've got, I've got a budget, I've got money to deal with. And so it's been a matter of trying to get the resources to the, the instructors, to the professors to really help their students, right? Because this was very abrupt. A lot of people had never taught online, for example, and immediately needed to start. And maybe they didn't have um, the right type of camera or the right type of sound equipment, or they'd never, you know, what do you, how do you use a learning management system? So it was a matter of, first of all, just trying to, to think clearly and, and to help people help each other. So that, that was sort of, but I mean, we're still in this, so I'm not really, it's a little bit hard to reflect back when you're still driving down the road at 80 miles an hour, but, but that's how it sort of started for me. Thank you, Damien. Yeah. The, uh, the challenges, the, even the, just the little technical challenges, like you're saying, the, 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 Oh, I don't have the right camera. Oh, my mic is part of my computer and that doesn't work or whatever it is. Or, uh, for some people were, were, those were really high bars, especially if they struggled with using technology. Um, all right, Father Ed. Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, the challenge for us, I think the principal thing that we try to do is to be a, to be a sign in the middle of the city of uh, faith. Everybody looks at us as a school, and it was certainly that, and, uh, and we teach all the normal subjects, but the, the primary thing that we work at doing here is to create create community, not just for the sake of community, but to be a sign of faith to those folks who contact this, this community so that others may come to know God uh, through an experience of us. Huh? And uh, you, can, you can do that if you see signs of faith, which are love and communion, people living together, strange people, right? Uh, some smart, some not so smart, um, some that are black, some that are brown, some that are white, all living together. And people look at that and they say, well, how is that possible that, th that these people can all do this and get along when everywhere else in the world we seem to be uh, at each other's throats? Well, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, it, it's, it becomes possible. So that's really what we try to do. So the pandemic kind of just in some ways um, made that visible community disappear. So we had to find other ways to, uh, to create community um, virtually which we've we actually worked at doing we we did it with we stopped school on the march 14th and on the 17th we were virtual and um, we had our morning meeting as we always do um virtually and we actually 
we actually discovered things that were going to continue. So there were some benefits to the pandemic that we we never would have discovered some of the things uh, had we not experienced the pandemic. So it's been interesting. I've been at yeah. this for 50 years almost. So um, I'm getting the hang of it a little bit. And uh, But creating community is what, what we're all about. It's the most important thing that we do. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everyone. And I hope we can get on to that topic of community uh, at some point in the rest of this conversation as well. Uh, Peter, I want to address a question to you first. Uh, you talked about how frustrating it was to basically almost start grad school. I suppose you got five months in before before going, uh, going online. Um, but obviously, that was something that was outside of your control. It wasn't as if you could get your university to teach in person instead. Uh, but it was a frustrating experience, right? Uh, my question is, what was missing about online grad school? Sure. And I mean, to answer the question, I think it's, it's worth talking for a moment about what graduate school looks like normally. Um, I mean, and very brief, briefly, I mean, graduate school is about studying something you love and studying it intensely and deeply for a long period of time. Um, and, you know, you, most people in graduate school um, sacrifice a lot of free time and, you know, either aren't making very much money or are paying a lot of money to do that. Um, and that is something in and of itself is, is tough. I, there's a there's a quote from Dostoevsky. I, it goes something like, you know, when a young person finds the truth, you know, they 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 want to they want to give their whole life for it, and they think that means dying for it. But it's actually a lot harder to give up, you know, six or seven years of your youth to to really studying that thing so you can better serve that truth. And um, and I, you know, I, I've never been in a situation where I've almost died, but I think there's some truth to that. Um, and uh, um, uh, you know, also with, with graduate school, there's, there's no societal pressure to be in graduate school like there is for undergraduate. You know, if things are in hard, hard for undergraduate, you know, most people go to college nowadays, you know, but not, most people don't go to graduate school. So you don't really have that recourse either um, when you're dealing with these pressure. And often the times the things you study in graduate school tend to be very esoteric of little practical import. Um, it's, it's just not apparent, you know. I, I studied, uh, last year I was working on an experiment with a very particular phenomenon in fluid mechanics that probably, did, who knows what it will have to do with anything in the future. Um, all of this is to say is that, you know, um, what makes graduate school what makes me really struggle in graduate school is knowing the meaning of what I do. Um, and, and the problem ultimately of graduate school and, you know, uh, is being helped to know the meaning of, of what you're studying, to be, to be carried through that. Um, and in my experience in those first five months, I, I really got to encounter some things that were quite phenomenal in, in helping me through, through that. Um, and I, can't describe it as, as anything other than community. Um, I met really brilliant people. Uh, my peers were all very interested in what they were doing and it was always a pleasure to talk to them and have my interest renewed uh, by their interest. Um, similarly with, uh, with the professors, um, uh, although they can be intimidating for, for their intellect, you know, you, you know, you really feel yourself challenged and, and it gives something to aspire to be. Um, or even interacting with undergraduates through TA, uh, you know, sometimes they just ask a really good question that stumps you um, and it makes you think. And I mean, you know, hanging out in the graduate student lounge, going to the coffee machine where everybody hangs out, you know, these sort of, you know, like I said before, organic human experiences that help that helped me continue on this path. So to, to answer your question of what was lacking in, 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 uh, in online learning graduate school, I mean, the answer is all of that. Um, uh, and uh, um, this kind of gets at what Michelle was saying, this atrophy, 
um, uh, associated with uh, with uh, not having support to go through, you know, the 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 beautiful experience that that education can be, but also the owner's experience that it can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, can we, uh, talk a little bit about that, that atrophy that Peter mentioned and that you, that you mentioned, um, you know, like you, you were obviously frustrated with going back to, with not being able to go back to school sooner, both for your children and for your students. Um, and you wanted to go back uh, f- maybe faster than other people were comfortable with, right? And I, I want to ask why, yeah, why? Like what, what did you see that was so crucial to in-person education or to education that was missing in distance learning? And like what was causing this atrophy? So I guess if, if education is an introduction to reality, then um, unfortunately it, my impression is that virtual learning for most people becomes a disengagement with reality, unfortunately, um, for lots of reasons. Part of it because human nature is weak and given less structure and more free time, there's a great misuse of it. Uh, Technology is a great temptation. And so there's a a lot of misuse and excessive use of it, of course. because for adolescents, I think for middle schoolers and high schoolers, a defining characteristic of adolescence is the need to learn from other peers and from adults outside of the family. They really need to look out of the family. And all of a sudden they were cooped up in their family. And, um, and then one last comment is that there's this huge disparity uh, when it comes to characters, that some characters naturally have more motivation and more emotional stability. And then when it comes to family cultures, that there are family cultures that have the the energy and the joy to deal with this and to propose ways to help their kids, you know, live well and and study well. And many families that don't have that energy and that joy, and they don't have the basis to really help. And it became, all those things became very apparent, those disparities. And so for all these reasons, um, with the, exception of very few, I felt this was an educational disaster. (laughs) Um, So um, I just was longing for them to be able to be back in person with everyone. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm struck just in hearing what you're saying that we uh, took a generation of children uh, and I'm not being critical of remote remote learning as a uh, per se, um, but just as as a basic fact that we took a generation of children who uh, we already know that there's a pandemic of screen addiction, and then said sit in front of your computer for six hours a day and don't get distracted. I mean that's <laughs> I know as a as an educator who's doing this over Zoom all the time that is extremely difficult um, for any kid for the most most for the kid with the most willpower and the most determination it's still difficult. Um, Damien, I wanted to, to bring the conversation to you because, uh, you know, obviously education was not just difficult for students, right? Education, and you mentioned this, uh, earlier has been very difficult for educators during this time, both in, um, K-12, like, like I am and in the university, um, and, uh, you know, I, I was saying to a friend that I, I, during the first few months of remote learning, I literally was having a hard time staying awake in the afternoon when I was teaching over Zoom. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what made this time so challenging for educators? Well, I mean, Zoom fatigue is real, right? Being online, being in front of a camera, being in front of a computer screen is real. I mean, I think the other thing is, You know, when you think about a professor in his or her classroom, you know, the students come to you and you create this environment and for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever it is, you know, you're in my house and and you're learning my my content. But it's interesting with the pandemic, something, at least in our case, in my case of my university, something different happened is that now I'm projected out into the students' lives. So let me tell you a story. Um, You know, we're a big campus, big urban campus, but we draw people from all over the the agricultural valleys to the south. Most of my students in the Spanish program, for example, are are, uh, 
Mexican, Mexican American origin, um, agricultural farm worker background. So I had a student who hadn't been in my classroom uh, for my online classroom for a couple of weeks. And I shot her an email and said, hey, what's up? Everything all right? You know, I wanted to check in. I hadn't seen any activity. And she wrote back to me like a day or so later saying, hey, professor, this is the first couple of months, by the way, of the of the pandemic. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's been hard to check in because, you know, I've been packing salads um, all day and all night for the last few weeks, you know, and so it's been tough to, to stay online. And so um, it's been tough to check in. So I just wanted to let you know that to appreciate that. And it was like, this, this person is in the middle of a pandemic and she's in a produce factory packing salads and trying to, to uh, follow class at the same time. I had another student who, same thing, I hadn't heard from him in a while. And I checked in with him and sure enough, he was in the, the National Guard. He was on deployment to another state, right? And he hadn't been able to uh, check in. Or else I, I had another um, colleague who said, yeah, my uh, one of my students told me about how she was listening to my lessons uh, on her phone as she was picking uh, fruit in the Salinas Valley, you know. So, you know, it's it's we it's been interesting to become cognizant of what of the fact that you are part of somebody else's life. They are not part of your world. Right. And in fact, that's why I think sometimes the the talk about safe spaces and so, uh, you know, university campuses is overrun by people wanting their safe space, et cetera, at least in the context that I'm in is, is really sort of off base because these are people who are, who are l struggling, living heroically every day. And it gives you a little window into the fact that, that you get to be part of that and you get to be in some way a companion on a really important journey for them. So, yeah, the fatigue of being online is real, um, but it's, it's, it's great to be cognizant of the fatigue that the, that the students, and, you know, that's the other thing is a lot of my colleagues, you know, they talk about um, the students as, yeah, these kids, et cetera. These are not kids. These are grownups living lives, and we're helping them to move to a, a, a stage of life where they can better accomplish their their dreams and their goals. So anyway, yeah, there's a lot wrapped up in that, but I think it's, it's, it's becoming cognizant of where you fit into these people's lives. Yeah. Uh, Father Edwin, I wanted to ask you what, um, what questions is it, you know, an administrator um, of a school, what questions came up? What were you, what figured into your uh, decisions about how to run St. Benedict's during the pandemic and what, what issues would you say emerged as most critical? Uh, well, the, the, as I said, I'm going to go back again to that, the issue of community. The first question that yeah. came up is how do we preserve as best we can some sense of, of community and uh, some sense of, of giving up what I want for what we need fundamentally what community is about, right? Giving up what I want for what we need. Uh, and we had, a, we had to work hard at, at deciding how we were going to, uh, to do that. It's, it's, uh, it's not easy uh, you know, to do. Uh, we're, made, we're, we're made to be connected, to be together. We even, we even talk about the mystery of the sublime, uh, the mystery of God as being communal, correct? We talk about father, son, spirit. It, this dynamism that Avery Dulles uh, Cardinal Dulles used to call it dynamism of the spirit of God. It moves in us and it, it kind of it holds us together. Uh, so when we're separated like that, it creates, um, it creates distress and, and the difficulty. So the first challenge that we had was to, was to try to create community somehow. Um, and uh, among, a, among a, a group of people, uh, uh, teenagers who, who, who um, who are up until four or five o'clock in the morning watching Netflix, right? I mean, that's it. And I mean, it's, uh, Michelle is absolutely right. It, it, all sense of day and night and everything else gets completely lost for these, for these young people. Um, and uh, it, it becomes a, a, um, 
a, a huge challenge, right? And and we have a lot. Our situation is a lot of our parents are are kind of essential workers, right? They're bus drivers. They work in hospitals. They're working in next nursing homes, and we and we have so many families living in multi generational houses, right? They've got grandma ma there. So there's this this tension among the adults in the house all the time. Is fear that somebody's going to infect somebody else because they can't just stay in the house, right? So all of that. All of those concerns are brought by these these students uh, to to the to the endeavor of trying to learn every day. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a big challenge. So having people available to be able to unpack all that stuff with the kids when when you see them kind of decompensating uh, is really 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 important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's open this. I would love to hear from, from the rest of the panel also about this question of, of community. This is crucial. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about my own experience teaching. I teach in the school where I normally teach. I don't teach from home and I don't, um, uh, I, I knew very quickly that that would not work for me. And my school has the space to do this, uh, the other, do it where we teach over zoom from school. But one thing I found almost instantly was how much I missed those little interactions with the students, you know, just walking around the hall, right? It's not the same when there's no one, no one there, but I wonder if you have thoughts about the challenge, um, the challenges this, this raised, but also what, what did you see about people in this moment as far as community goes? Well, we have an interesting, um, cultural challenge. We have students on, on the property. Uh, we decided pretty quickly that the five and six and seven year olds cannot learn virtually. Or if they're going to learn virtually, it means mom or dad can't do anything else except sit next to them uh, the whole time uh, of day. So it, we've had those, our, our elementary students who've, who've wanted to be here, whose parents wanted to be here, they've been in uh, every day. And we have another group of students that we know don't do well virtually. We make them come in and uh, with their parents' cooperation, and uh, they're here being supervised. Um, our teachers are all teaching here uh, as well um, from the building. So a group of them come in, but, but that presents a challenge too because the virus, um, you know, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family. Somebody said they were, an Irish, they were Irish Catholic. Um, yeah, there you go. And uh, so six feet for us, is a little close, you know what I mean? That's a, <laughs> but if you're if you're a Latin uh, Latin American or African American or from the African dispersion or from Italy or Spain, or, I mean, it's impossible to keep people away from each other. Everybody has to hug each other and shake hands and be touching each other and all. So that makes it real difficult when you have students on the property when you have to keep so-called uh, social distancing physical distancing it's it's a very big challenge um so it's it, that's another thing to think about is the social implications the cultural implications of the uh of the virus when we're trying to bring people back uh back together it's been a big challenge for us um but i agree with with everybody i walking around the building with nobody in it i we've had our teams trying to practice now and our activities, our theater is, is coming in. We're trying to bring more and more people onto the property. But the other day I heard a couple of students under my window in the monastery, they were out on the street and they were talking in such a loud voice. Right? And I, I looked out my window and here they are about six inches away from each other, two African-American kids. And they're going at it, talking about this, that, and the other thing. So I had to go downstairs. I went out on the front stoop that's right behind me right now. Uh, virtually, and uh, and I started uh, screaming at them for being so close together and everything. I said to myself afterwards, "Wow, that felt good. I haven't done that in eleven months. <laughs> I had, an, had an opportunity to have to yell at somebody. So, uh, yeah, you miss that. You mean you, not, you don't hear balls bouncing in gyms. You don't hear conversations going on about class or about anything. It's it's a it's a big uh, it's a suffering, is what it is. It's a suffering." You're saying you run an all boys inner city school. You came by that that raspy voice naturally. Yeah, well, it was an all boys uh, uh, inner city school in um, up until last year and the high school level. But uh, then the two schools closed. Two Catholic schools closed, 
And the group of girls broke in here. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way to say it. I mean, they connived with our guys and decided that they wanted to create a girls' division, not a co-ed school, but a girls' division of St. Benedict's Prep. And uh, there was just no stopping them. So uh, they kind of overran us. And now we, have, now we have a girls' division of 86 students, which will grow next year to 110 students, uh, all because of the unbelievable efforts of... Um, of a bunch of teenagers. They did it themselves. We, we just were, the adults were forced into cooperating with them and to help them make it happen. That sounds like reality hitting. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to this question that came up, Peter, and what you were saying about motivation. Um, you know, what, what we realized in my school, you know, almost instantly, and for whatever reason, at least I did not anticipate this. I was more focused on the technical challenges of transitioning to remote learning, uh, and I didn't think about this, this question of, like, whether the kids would still be motivated. And almost instantly, like, many students who did not struggle much with motivation earlier began to. And I wonder, um, you know, like, why was the why did motivation become so difficult for us for you per, first peter and then we'll we'll open it up to everyone yeah i mean for me personally um it was it was difficult to remain motivated uh, um i mean because like i said before i mean the things that usually support me and keeping me motivated were were taken away um I mean, uh, I can give you an example. Uh, I have a friend who's, who's brilliant, who uh, is just very easy, very easy going, and it's just, you know, physics is like a nice walk in the park for him. And, and he's the person I go to when I, when I ask for help. And, uh, you know, we became really good friends because we were TAing the same course together. Um, and, uh, and, you know, normally when I would go to him for help, I would be freaking out. I'd be like, oh, my God, I don't understand any of this. Why am I here? Why am I? Why did I try to study physics? It's this is too hard. Nothing. None of this makes sense. None of this works. You know, and my friend was like, Peter, you, this is you understand this. You've done stuff like this before. Uh, uh, and you would just, you know, write out, you know, you know, in his in his very uh, simple way, you know, here, it's just this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that's right, you know? And, you know, I'd just be totally diffused and, and, and we'd be, we ha be happy to continue uh, uh, studying and working. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, those, sort of, those sorts of uh, natural things uh, which, which helped me on, on, on my path, uh, I mean, they were taken away. I mean, the whole point of what makes those valuable is you don't have, you know, you only have to go a little bit out of your way. You know, you just ask a friend for help and, and then something beautiful comes out of it, you know, and, and, you know, human nature is weak as, as Michelle said. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, you know, why, why look for something that's not, you know, uh, uh, prevalent, yeah. uh, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, panelists, I'd love to hear what you think about this question of motivation as, as far as what you, what you saw and, and both for yourself and for your students, um, you know, why did we struggle so much with education and what does that reveal about what's essential in education? Well, you know, one of the things that I've discovered over the last few years, you know, once again, being in the, the college environment, it's really easy to get caught up in teaching people your subject, right? Because um, it, you're a little bit removed, not like being on a high school campus or, or a school. Um, you're, you go, you walk into a classroom, you teach your, your subject, you leave, the students leave, you see them in another couple of days or what, you know. But uh, one of the things I've seen over the years is that that you really, the education doesn't stop, right? That being a, an educator, even if it's on a college campus, means being an educator in the sense that, that I'm also responsible for, for being a uh, partner with this person in, in things other than just the content that I'm teaching, right? So 
you know, for me, it's, it's really started to be, yeah, I don't, I don't mind. I, I, I share my experience as a parent with my students. Many of my students are parents, right? Or um, just little things about, you know, um, how to dress when you go on a job interview, right? Or um, just the fact that, that I have a life experience that other people can, that perhaps can help other people, right? Um, is something that, that I have to be cognizant of. And not only that, but that, um, that there's a lot that I can learn from the students in my classroom because they're bringing experiences once again that I don't have. And so the, um, so then you have to get out of your content a little bit. And, and for example, now when we're all online, et cetera, at least in a college context, it's harder, right? You have to try and find those, those moments to carve out, to be with your students. Like, for example, if I have Zoom office hours, I'm not worried if they go over, right? Because this is my chance to, to spend some time with this person, right? And to get to know uh, him or her better. Or it's a chance to, um, to understand the struggles that somebody else is going through and to share my own with them. So the, I think that the motivation comes from, you know, two things, achieving a goal that you're, that you're trying to achieve, but knowing that you're not alone on it, that, that, you know, that there's a, that there's a point up ahead that we're both walking to together. And it's, it's a little bit harder now because you can't, at least, like I said, for me, you can't be there physically, but, but we're still together and to understand what it means to be together with another person in a way that's different is, is a really interesting sort of, uh, adventure right now. Yeah. Um, Shell or Father Edwin, do you guys want to chime in on this question? The motivation? Um, so we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of ideals about education that are often very helpful, um, that come from our charism and other places. Education is, I guess that light just went on. Education is a communication of oneself and not a project. Um, education is more like the lighting of a fire than the filling of a pail. Uh, my son's headmaster says that one often, and I love it. Education's purpose is to reawaken the freedom and set it in motion. These are things that I find very beautiful and helpful when I'm in a normal teaching situation. And in the online situation that we had in spring and that I partially have now, right now I have about 80% of my students in person and about 20% online. Somehow they all fall flat. They all fall dead. Even the idea that COVID itself can be the provocation that reawakens them and reawakens me. It all seems to fall dead and fall flat. I felt like I had been stripped. I guess the light went off again. <laughs> Sorry if I'm flashing. I felt like I had been stripped of so much of my joy and my efficacy as a teacher. And I felt like my students had been stripped of their community and their friendships and it allowed themselves to fall into apathy and laziness. And so what was left? What was really left? Well, to some extent, I started to think it would just be frustration and drudgery. And then the reality of what happened both in the spring and continues to happen now with my online students is that um, what I discover is that having been stripped of everything, I discover that I love them, that I love them tremendously, that I'm overwhelmed by how much I love them, that in the same way, I can on a morning when I'm tired and when my job seems a drudgery and the weather's miserable, that I can find, make the effort to get out of bed and say, if I don't have time, even say a one line or two line prayer to say, Jesus, save my day, make my day worthwhile. That if I can do that for myself, the same way I can look at them and say, their life is a gift. My life is a gift and their life is a gift. And they've been given to me. Even if it's just an hour a day, they've been given to me. And so I have this tremendous sense of responsibility and attachment to them. And I, I've had a lot of anger and bitterness about the online situation because I find it really frustrating. And because well, teaching both in person and online has actually been very, very burdensome and very time consuming. And there were many things I swore I wouldn't do. I'm not gonna do double classes. They won't get the classes in person, but I'm not gonna do another set of classes after school. I don't have time for it. And 
you know, all these things I told myself I wouldn't do. I'm going to skip this chapter. Kids online are never going to understand this content. And over and over, I find myself that I'm surprised by how much energy that love gives me. That I often, I'm increasing always the amount I'm Zooming after school. I'm not cutting short the chapters of the content I thought I would because I care for them. And so ironically enough, having felt like I was stripped of everything, I was left with something tremendous, which yeah. is just the fact that I want their happiness and I want their well-being. And yeah. it doesn't feel like a triumphant or beautiful story. It's not full of deep, insightful quotes and great experiences. Sometimes it feels more like just suffering with them mm -hmm. and like trying to impart them with just a desire to live well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Father Edwin, if you wanted to jump in here as well. Sure. I, uh, we have a, um, a relationship in Chedera uh, um, in Israel. And uh, we've been back and forth. Our kids have been back and forth uh, and their kids have been here. Um, I heard a story in Israel from, uh, from a man once and he said that two Jews were speaking to each other. Two men, one said to the other, he said, Irv, uh, do you love me? And Irv said, uh, Moshe, you know that I love you. And Moshe said, but do you know my suffering? And Irv said, no, I don't know your suffering. He said, then how can you say you love me? So understanding each other's sufferings uh, in the midst of this pandemic is what we're called to do. And that's as, as, as we understand one another's sufferings, uh, young people's, young people understanding older people's sufferings, and we, that's in that in that endeavor, we become the sign uh, to, to others of uh, faith and that, that God may be able to be seen through us um, in, that, in, that, uh, in that experience. And what we, we actually discovered, our faculty during the pandemic has been over the top energetic. It's been unbelievable creating all kinds of, of clubs and baking clubs and all kinds of things that we were not doing before. Uh, ways of pulling uh, people together, but it also becomes an encouragement because if you're online with a student, you have no idea who's listening over their shoulder. So a mother or a grandmother or something. We now, at our morning meeting, we have 2,000 people coming to it, watching it. We have a group now who, who are, whose attendance is taken by our kids, and they're all 80-year-old women or older. And they, they come every single day because why? They're encouraged by seeing these young people, number one, pray together and then make announcements and plan the day. And if our morning meeting goes over, we just change the school schedule. I don't change it. One of the students changes the school schedule. And we go longer if, and it runs over almost every day because the, the, the African dispersion's view of the clock is completely different than those of us who are further north on the globe. Uh, where we tend to be more precise, but uh, it's as uh, Italians will tell you that, or, or, and Spaniards too, right? it's an approximation, right? <laughs> We're supposed to start at eight o'clock, more or less. So, but this meeting has been um, our alumni come to it. And if there's an alumnus who's 78 or 80 years old who's not at the meeting, the kids are looking for them. They're making calls to see if they're okay. So there's been a whole d dynamic that's happened here that uh, has been an encouragement to me in the midst of this, this strange time. It's been, uh, 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 and it's not been miserable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's somehow the plagues in Egypt led to new life, right? So I don't know, I don't know how the new life is going to uh, manifest itself, but I, I believe that, that it will out of this whole thing. Well, and it seems like you have glimpses of that new life as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, Peter, you mentioned this at the very beginning, that, uh, that grad school um, is already a place in which you spend a large portion of your time wondering why you're doing it in the first place. Um, and I think, that, I mean, that to me is the question of motivation, right? Is why should I bother to do this? That's what I hear from my students constantly. And I tell them, and I get sometimes flack from parents for saying this, I tell them that's the right question for you to be asking right now. Ask that question. Be serious about that question, but ask it seriously because there's two ways to ask question why, right? You can ask why and mean no, or you can ask why and mean why. And, and, and I, oftentimes they ask why because they don't want to do it, right? They, they ask why as a way of, of, of rejecting 
what's being proposed, whatever that is, whether, you know, my physics homework, uh, would be, would be one of those things. Sorry, because I know some of my physics students will see this eventually. Um, uh, you know, but it seems to me that that question, right. And that, that question of like, why should I do this thing? Um, is, is a question we should be encouraging students to ask. And so even in the, the, the challenge of motivation that we're experiencing, that question is coming up. It's another, to me, another glimpse of that light that you're referring to, Father Edwin, um, is, is just that that question has become more apparent. Um, as far as, I mean, hopefully for all of us, for educators as well as students, right? Because it's not just the students that need to be asking why. I, um, I, I wanted to, to ask a question to the group here. Um, so uh, Time Magazine made a provocative cover uh, in 2020, end of the 2020, it said 2020, the worst year ever, right? Some of you probably saw that. Um, on March 13th of 2020, so the day before, the last day we had in-person classes at my school, um, I had an eighth grader ask me, in eighth grade science, ask me, Mr. T, um, can we just not have school until the pandemic's over? Right, so now we're 11 months into this. Um, should we have followed my student's suggestion? Was it really worth it to go through this whole experience? Whoever wants to can start. Uh, um, well, the fundamental question for us should be, right, well, did the cro does the cross, is it worth it? Is suffering meaningful or is suffering absurd? Right, that, I think, mm -hmm. well, I, I would say, yeah, it's meaningful. I hope everybody on the screen would say it's meaningful, but uh, I think that's the, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Peter, you do physics for us. That's why you do physics, Peter, <laughs> for us. Not for you, but for us. Yeah, I, um, I mean, was it worth it to, to go through this? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Father Ed. Um, I mean, uh, suffer, I mean, there's, you know, to quote um, Lorenzo Albacete, who, uh, who uh, there were many other interesting talks and exhibits uh, about during the New York encounter, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, suffering is, is uh, uh, an opportunity to, you know, become very intimate with this question of why. Um, and uh, I mean, what we need is, is something that answers that question, but uh, an answer that's tantamount to the cry, which is, you know, something as real as the cry. Um, so, I mean, was it worth it? Um, I think it was worth it, but I should add that, you know, I think the, the the answer to the question, uh, uh, the prerogative of answering the question is within the heart of every single human being that's gone through it, ultimately. Um, was it worth it? Well, it's, you know, it's not an obvious question and, and it, uh, it, you know, it, it might take, you know, two, 10, 20 years after this is all over to, to see, you know, to see, uh, the resurrection. Um, I mean, you know, even Jesus waited three days, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to, I, I want to add a question to that question. Um, I suppose, which is what did you, and this is for, for, for all of you, but maybe Damien, if you could jump in, uh, first here, what did you discover that uh, in this whole experience that is essential to education, and instead, what did you discover that was that's actually that we've been doing and maybe not questioning, right? That was that's actually inessential to education. Yeah, well, I think that the people at Time Magazine need to get a little perspective because I think 1914 was pretty bad, and I think 1939 was also kind of rough year. So I, you know, I think that. That what has been essential, let's, you know, for me, what has been essential has been my, my um, relationship with my wife and children. 
that I, I got to know myself more as a husband and father and as a bad husband and father, <laughs> right? And it was a grace in the sense that, that it's been a grace to be able to, to, to stop and, and see yourself in action, you know, that catch yourself in your daily life. So I think that it's been um, the essential part has been to, to take stock of who I am, right? And secondly, I think once again, the, the, the essential part of education that I've seen here is to, um, I guess it was Father Edwin that just said, you know, do you understand my suffering, right? Do I understand the suffering of the person in front of me do I understand the person, the suffering of the person on the other side of the Zoom chat with me? And I can't get inside their skin, but I can understand that they are living enormous challenges, that challenges are too much for them because I'm living challenges are too much for me. So what can I do to express the fact that I'm living that we're all living these challenges that are too much for us. I think a to have to try and have a moment of tenderness um, whenever possible with myself and with with the other person, and to also um, look at where there's hope. Right? I mean, there's a lot of navel gazing going on in our in our first world situation, but if you look at reality, you know just from the fact that I wake up in the morning in a home with a roof, with a wife and children and that I did, that God gave me, you know, that, that, that already is a sign that, that reality is good and that someone loves me. And, and secondly, that um, to acknowledge that is, is the best thing that I can do uh, for anybody that I, that I happen to meet that life, that life is still good. And that whoever, that the person that making that life that's making me uh, loves me. And oftentimes that's, that's not explicit, right? But it's, but it's through the way that I look at you or through the way that I try and attend to your needs, right? So that's, you know, and then the other stuff, do, do, are we hitting our learning outcomes? Well, I hope so, but, but not always. Um, but but are we there for our students and for each other as faculty members? Yeah, that I can answer yes to. Yeah, like this, I love what you just said, this learning outcome. Like if, if, if our metric is some learning outcome, right? If we, if we think we can put education into a computer and have it do it for us. Well, we, we just did an 11 month experiment on whether or not you can just, education is, a, is a, 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 a something that you can just computerize, right? And even, right, the first thing we tried to do is try to turn it back into a relationship because we know on some level, right, even if I'm over Zoom, education's a relationship. Peter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I just I second that. I mean, I think one thing I, uh, I've experienced is I've, I mean, I was never too into technology making education better, but I've certainly fallen more out of love with it because it's just – doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> the, 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 my iPad lags, and I'm while I'm writing an equation that's screen mirroring, and there's like put right chalk in the board is so much easier, you know. And uh, uh, and I mean, you know, and, you know, all all that is to say, you know, like, you know, th there is really something to you know being in a classroom and, and being with those people and just and and having that simple human interaction and, and having that place that's that's dedicated for that, um, yeah. Um, I guess I think that it's an obvious point, but the difficulties have um, given us an occasion of urgency to communicate, to, to affirm life and to affirm our students and to affirm how precious what we've been given is and that even the chance to learn is so precious. And um, it's a privilege in a way to be able to live a terrible circumstance so that we have the chance to say, look, life is still worth living. I know it is. And that's often an, an ironic attempt. It doesn't always work. But sometimes I think if there's some students who the only thing they've learned from me this year is perhaps 
to live through a pandemic without fear or to live through a pandemic fearful, but yet in some ways peaceful about the fact that I'm fearful or perhaps to live through a pandemic disdaining others' fear, but attempting to be compassionate about that. You know, I mean, even just the simple things that we communicate, there's something there's something great in an occasion that's uh, an occasion of crisis. The other thing that it, the crisis gave me was a sense of urgency that there's so much these kids need. There's such a great need and there's so much we have to give them that in a way, every single moment we have is so precious, is so, there's not a minute to waste. There's not an occasion to waste. Everything we can live with them is worth it. So whether it be, whether it be sometimes some of them allow me to kind of enjoy when I chide them about their sleep schedule or their, what they eat or, you know, talk about just the simple things of life. And all those things are great occasions. Every once in a while, I tell them the homework for the weekend is to do something beautiful. <laughs> and then we get in a big argument as to what something beautiful is or isn't and talk about what's worth doing and what your time is worth. And, and anyway, I think especially as a parent, all those, all those, that sense of urgency that everything they have is an occasion for something beautiful and that we won't be succeeding in offering that beautiful thing to them, but that we have to have the persistency just casting and casting and casting again until, until something that we offer is received. And I think it is. Yeah. I think when we have the authenticity to offer because we really care for them and the humility, then it is received. Even one of my most unreceptive and, difficult students who won't turn her camera on for me except for a moment when I beg her to she briefly turns it on and turns it off she's still at the end of every class says thank you thank you Mrs. Rati thank you and so mm-hmm. I don't know I receive that as a little something and as a motivation to continue yeah so I, I don't want to close without asking this question so even though we're we're running a little late I want to ask very briefly uh to each of you, what is the one thing? So it's, it, it's fall 2021, we're all vaccinated, everybody can come back to life as normal. What is the one thing you take with you from this experience that you don't want to lose? Do you want to go ahead, Michelle, since you're... I don't know, that, that we're so precious to each other, that 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 what we offer each other is so much greater than, than the things we're afraid of, whether yeah. it be illness or doing things exactly right. And that, that our companionship to each other is truly precious. Mm-hmm. Damien. Yeah. I would say that we need each other, that I need you. Um, and that you're an essential part of my life. Father Edwin. Uh, I think that uh, I, I agree with Damien uh, on several of these things. That uh, that we're, we're as I said said in the very beginning, I'm going to end where we started, where I started at least. That we're, we're made to be connected. We're made to be uh, in contact with one another, just like the mystery of God. And we're made in God's image. If we if if we believe it, then we we've, we're feeling it right now. And that uh, from this experience, uh, um, the value of the other. Is what I think you take out of it. And Peter? Yeah, I certainly second all of this. Um, but I think one thing I I'll also take away is um, a, a renewed appreciation for my education. I mean, to be educated really is a privilege. Yeah. In the best, in the best sense of the word. Um, and, you know, it teaches you how to enjoy the things that are valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our guests for this riveting discussion. Um, And thank you to Benedictine College for making it possible. Um, One more final event tonight at six o'clock. Hope always surprises me, six o'clock Eastern. We started the encounter with a question. We all want to move forward after 2020, but how? How can we embrace what lessons we learned? What gives us certainty in the future? In a word, what gives us hope? So we decided to end with witnesses of hope. We decided to end with five people who could share with us their experience of what allows them to engage with the challenges that they are faced with in reality. And it's an event you don't want to miss. 
that, uh, that event is at 6 p.m. Eastern. Between now and then, you've got time to watch one of the exhibits, to join a Zoom encounter on education that's being put together by some friends in, in Washington, D.C., uh, or to make a sustaining donation to the New York Encounter in order to keep making this work possible throughout the year. You know, the, the 2021 Encounter uh, ends tonight, and the work for the 2022 Encounter begins tomorrow morning. Uh, so please consider making a monthly donation to keep the encounter going. You can do that right at newyorkencounter.org slash donate or at right here below the embedded video on the New York Encounter homepage. You can also join the conversation on social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram at, at NYEncounter, and you can find us by searching New York Encounter on Facebook as well. We've got an amazing tech team that's been working almost around the clock to keep these pages current and to share with you and the world everything that the Encounter is putting together right now. So help us get the word out there to by following, liking, retweeting, and letting people that you know know how much you loved the events that you participated in during the Encounter. Finally, we've added uh, just today a Zoom encounter um, at 8 p.m. tonight. It's a singing event. You can register for it at newyorkencounter.org. Um, see you at 6 p.m. for Hope Always Surprises Me. Beauty is the attractive power of the truth or the splendor of the truth. And so you could ask, what would the sun be without warmth and light? What would food be without deliciousness? So we can say, what's the truth without beauty? What's the truth without the compelling power, the delightful power to accept it and to live it and to love it? In the Catholic theological tradition, beauty is the clarity and the radiance of the inner reality of something. Beauty actually inspires love. Benedictine College is a place where people live the faith joyfully. The Catholic faith is on display in every corner. So if we're going to talk about the faith, we're going to talk about worship, we're going to talk about Christ, we're going to talk about education, if we can present it in a way that moves everybody's will toward that good, then we're actually inspiring love in them. We can transform the culture by bringing the sweetness and the delight of God's love through the material things of the world. That's the mission of Benedictine College.